All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA exam practice series where we're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like, subscribe, and share. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. A grandma is teaching her grandchildren how to bake Christmas cookies. Grandma uses her secret recipe that requires a special mixing technique for the dough. For each grandchild, grandma will tell the child to grab the mixing spoon, and then grandma will grab the child's hand and they will start to mix. What type of prompting does this most resemble? So we have a prompting question, and we want to identify where the prompt is first. We know grandma needs the children to mix the dough a certain way. So grandma says, grab the spoon. And then what does she do? She prompts the child by grabbing the child's hand and mixing. So grandma is essentially doing the behavior for the child with physical force. She's grabbing the child's hand and the, the child's hand and they are mixing together. So what type of prompting does that resemble? Well, A, physical prompting. It isn't partial physical because grandma is actually grabbing the child's hand and mixing with them. She's doing the full response for them. It's not graduated guidance. It's graduated guidance. We fade in physical prompting and then fade it out as quickly as possible. And it isn't necessarily errorless learning because she does give the SD to grab the mixing spoon, but then we'll grab the child's hand to start to mix. So it's not explicitly stated. She's not preventing errors. We do know for a fact, however, that she is physically prompting the grandchildren. Andre used to go out late at night to the tennis court by his house, turn on the lights, and practice. Today, however, when Andre went to the courts and tried to turn on the lights, the lights did not come on. After a few days, Andre stopped going to the court at night. What consequence influenced Andre's behavior? First, what do we know about Andre's behavior? Did it increase or decrease? Well, it decreased, right? Andre stopped going to the court. So that tells us this was either punishment or extinction. So now we have to ask ourselves, was something added, taken away, or withheld? Well, used in, in the past, Andre would go to the tennis court, turn on the lights, and he'd practice. Now, when he goes to the courts, the lights don't come on. So one, Andre's no longer receiving reinforcement for turning on the lights. Two, Andre's no longer receiving reinforcement for being able to practice at night. So of course, if Andre is no longer receiving reinforcement, for a previously reinforced behavior, he's not going to go to the court because his behavior is on extinction. So what consequence influenced Andre's behavior? A, negative reinforcement. We know it's not reinforcement because Andre's behavior decreased and reinforcement increases. Extinction is what we predicted. Andre was getting reinforced for turning the lights on and going to the court. Now that reinforcement is being withheld. It isn't positive or negative punishment because the consequences aren't adding or taking away anything, right? Reinforcement is just being withheld. And when reinforcement is withheld, that's when we consider it extinction. So the consequence influencing Andre's behavior is extinction. Paul, a behavior analyst, is struggling to figure out what to do with a case of his. Paul's treatment plan has been effective for the last month, but the family recently told Paul that they would like to incorporate more of their own culture into service delivery. Paul doesn't have an issue with this, but he is worried it may interfere with the effectiveness of the current treatment. What should Paul do? This is a challenging situation because Paul is correct. One, he's correct that he should be incorporating culture from those families into the treatment plan. But two, he needs to be effective. So the, the, the difficult thing is to find the balance, right? How do we balance incorporating what the family wants as far as culture goes, while also remaining effective. As a good behavior analyst, what should Paul do? A, sit down with the family and explain that the client's progress takes precedent over including their cultural values. This is not necessarily true, right? Yes, client progress is very important, but if we're progressing in a way that doesn't fit a socially valid, meaningful change as far as the family's concerned, then our effectiveness has to be questioned. B, rewrite, rewrite his treatment plan so that it closely adheres to the family's cultural values. He could, 
but then he's also risking the effectiveness. So he's got to be very careful here. C, have a conversation with the family explaining the situation and attempt to find a balance. Yes, we have to take the collaborative approach here. Paul can tell them I respect and I want to include the culture, but we also have to remain conceptually systematic. We've got to be effective. How can we balance this out? C is the most ethical and the most collaborative way to handle the situation. D, transfer the client to a different analyst if he is unfamiliar with the culture. That's just not always possible, right? You're going to be working with a lot of different families from a lot of different backgrounds. It's on you at times to make yourself familiar with things that you don't know that much about. What should Paul do? He needs to have a conversation with the family, explaining the situation, and attempt to find a balance. Martin is venting to his wife about the issues he is having at work. He tells her all about his employees who forget to clock in or who show up several minutes late each day. He also tells her about his own boss who forces him to work late hours and refuses to give him a raise until the end of the year. What goal of behavior analysis is best represented in this scenario? When we are talking about goals of behavior analysis, we have three. We have description, prediction, control. Description is simply stating the facts. What are we seeing happen? What is happening? I'm not making assumptions, I'm not experimenting, we're just stating facts. Prediction, now we're making a hypothesis. We're drawing correlations. This might cause this. Control is experimentation. We're actually running experiments to try to verify or not verify our hypothesis. In Martin's case, what is he doing? Well, he's venting. He's just telling her about what's happening. His employees aren't showing up. His boss is making him work late. He's not getting a raise. He's not really correlating anything here. He's not making hypotheses. He's just telling her about his issues. And he's not experimenting. He's not trying to change anything here. So the goal best represented here is description. And the goal questions, ask yourself, am I just stating facts? Am I trying to make or draw correlations? Or am I actually experimenting to establish functional control? Your daughter wants a snack and starts whining while saying, I need a snack. You tell her that she needs to ask again, but she can't be whining when she does. So she says, okay, and then I need a snack without whining. So you let her pick something from the pantry. What type of differential reinforcement does this resemble? So let's be careful here, right? Differential reinforcement question. And we ask ourselves first on all differential reinforcement questions, are we teaching a replacement behavior? And in this case, we are. Why? Well, we want the daughter to ask for a snack, but not whine. So that's different, right, than not engaging in a behavior. Because asking for a snack while whining is different for asking for a snack and not whining. Those are two different topographies, two different responses. So we are reinforcing a specific replacement behavior, which means it can't be a DRO. With the DRO, we're not reinforcing a specific alternative. We're just reinforcing for a behavior not happening. A DRO might be you reinforce the daughter whenever she's not whining with no specific alternative. But here we have an alternative behavior. Now, could this be an incompatible behavior? Absolutely. Can you ask while whining and not whining at the same time? No. So not only is this alternative, but it's also incompatible. So B, different ritual reinforcement of lower rates. We're not lowering the rates here, right? We're not setting criterions. We're trying to replace it. And we're replacing it with an incompatible behavior. Not only is it alternative, it's incompatible. This is a tricky question that requires a little thought and a little time, right? That's why we're going slowly and why we attack the question first before going to the answer choices. A 13-year-old client has no issues with communication or socializing, but they struggle with everyday tasks like ordering lunch at school or doing their own laundry at home. The primary issue based on a functional behavior assessment is the client engages in escape behavior when presented with a difficult task demand. What type of chaining would you likely want to use first in this case? We have a chaining question and it's up to you as the behavior analyst to consider the facts and then choose a method. That's what your job is, right? We have a 13 year old with no communication or socializing issues, but they struggle with everyday tasks. Okay, we, we understand that. So we want to teach tasks. The issue 
based on an FBA, as the client engages in escape behavior when presented with a difficult task demand. So what does that tell you? That says when the client is given an instruction, they want to escape. So if that's the case, would you use forward chaining? Probably not. Because with forward chaining, they need to do that first step independently. But if they want to engage in escape when presented with a difficult task, that first step might be very difficult to teach and handle. What might be better is a backward chaining procedure where we're prompting through the whole task and then they get to escape as soon as they do one response to start. Backwards chaining is a lot of times better if escape maintained behavior is very prominent. Total task might be the worst here because they need to do the whole task and they are already engaging in escape even when presented with the difficult task demand. And then an interruption strategy. Well, we know an interruption strategy comes after we've already done the chaining. If we've got a situation where escape behavior is prominent, backwards chaining is very often the best case scenario. Landry is working closely with a physical therapist to improve their client's ability to run and jump as the client would like to play sports at their school. Landry is taking into consideration the physical therapist suggestions, but is always referring back to the behavior analyst task list and his applied behavior analysis books when creating treatments. Landry appears to be adhering to what dimension? Dimension questions can be tricky because they have to be specific, but I think this one is very straightforward. What do we know? We know is Landry is collaborating, which is great, with a physical therapist. He's taking the suggestions at face value and trying to incorporate them, but he's making sure he's adhering to the task list and to ABA books. So what is Landry trying to do? He's trying to be conceptually systematic. We are sticking to ABA principles and ideas. Even when collaborating with outside forces, we are still adhering to our task list. B, generality. Notice we always read all of our answer choices. Generality has to do with generalization, which is not what Landry is doing here. Analytic has to do with establishing a functional relationship, not necessarily, again, what Landry is focused on here. And then technological has to do with repeatability. We're not looking at repeatability. We're looking at the fact that Landry wants to remain conceptually systematic by sticking to the task list and ABA books. After three separate functional analyses, data show that tantrum behaviors are trending upwards during demand conditions and tangible conditions, but rarely during alone conditions. Based on this data, what conclusion should not be drawn? The important piece here, right, because we have a functional analysis and we have different conditions. We have a demand condition, a tangible condition, and an alone condition. And during demand and tangible, what is happening? Well, those behaviors are kind of going upwards, right? So both conditions, the behavior's up. Alone, behavior's sitting down here. If the behavior is not happening during an alone condition, what should we try and rule out? Well, we should try and rule out automatically maintained because demand and tangible are both socially mediated more often than not, especially demand. Alone condition has to do with automatic. If the behavior does not happen when alone, let's not conclude that the behavior is automatically maintained. So A, the behavior is possibly functioning as escape, very likely given it happens during the demand condition. The behavior is possibly functioning to obtain an item, very possible given it's happening when needing a tangible. The behavior is likely automatically maintained, much less likely the behavior is not occurring when alone. You're walking down the street towards your favorite coffee shop. Approaching from the other direction is another person. As you pass them, you say, excuse me. They reply with, sorry, I didn't even see you there. In this scenario, the person you say, excuse me, to is the what? Kind of a funny, strange, written question, right? Because it's kind of hard to understand what it's asking at first. Because it's asking about the person you say, excuse me, to. What do we know about that person? We know you pass them pass them and you say, excuse me, and then they reply. So if you said, excuse me, you were talking to them, they were the, the listener, they replied, which made them the speaker. So in this scenario, is that person the speaker, the listener, both or neither? Well, they're going to be both. 
And why do we ask this question? Because in verbal behavior, there's a speaker and there's a listener. When the listener talks, then they become the speaker and the speaker becomes the listener. So this is just reinforcing the idea of that I, of the, the concept that ver verbal behavior involves a speaker and a listener and the roles can change. You're talking with a parent regarding a couple of things that have suddenly started to occur outside of session. The parents tell you that the client is stealing food routinely from his brother's room and is also waking up in the middle of the night to play video games without permission. Stealing food and waking up in the middle of the night to play video games would be considered what based on this information? Based on this information, what do we know so far? We know that the parent is telling you about new behaviors, right? They're not describing specific instances of these behaviors. They're just saying, hey, the client is routinely stealing food and has been waking up to play video games. They're not describing a specific instance. So if we're not talking about specific instances of behaviors, then these are just A, behaviors. Responses would be a singular instance of this occurring. And now that might seem a little over specific, but for the exam, we want to be, right? Behaviors and responses are often used interchangeably in practice. For the exam, you want to be specific. A response class. Well, we don't necessarily know what the function is, so we can't necessarily classify these yet as a response class. We don't know what the function is. We don't know if they are matching the same reason or occurring for the same reason. And then a stimulus class, well, they are behaviors, so they are not going to be part of a stimulus class. So the answer here is behaviors because we're not talking about a single occurrence. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe, share, and like. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.